Isaac Newton's book, Principia Mathematica, arguably the origin of all modern physics, in that book, Isaac Newton started by contrasting what he called uh, rational mechanics versus uh, practical mechanics. And let me just read you what he, what, he, what, is, what he had said about that. Quoting Newton, The ancients considered mechanics in a twofold respect, as rational, which precedes accurately by demonstration, that is experimentation, and the practical. To practical mechanics, all the manual arts belong, from which mechanics took its name. By rational mechanics, Newton meant the mathematical demonstration of a physical process. Rational mechanics are the mathematical operations by which practical mechanics proceed. Practical mechanics, on the other hand, proceed as art, that is, as operations which produce demonstrable effects, but which do not require full knowledge of the mathematical principles. Practical mechanics might proceed outside of rational mechanics, but with an increasing risk of inefficiency. To quote Newton, what is perfectly accurate is called geometrical, what is less so is called mechanical. But the errors are not in the art, but in the artifices. He that works with less accuracy is an imperfect mechanic, and if any could work with a perfect accuracy he would be the most perfect mechanic of all. To become Newton's most perfect mechanic in this matter of producing a practical nuclear capacitor which can capture beta decay energy, we must closely align ourselves with the rational mechanics or the mathematical operations which our thorium-234 experiments provided us. The data from those experiments identified the mathematical principles by which a proposed machine must operate. They provided the rational mechanics which we must adopt. The mathematical principles governing the high-voltage nuclear capacitor are quantum in nature. They are rational mechanics which are quantum mechanics, but of a different sort than identified by the term quantum mechanics in consensus physics. They are quantum mechanics which operate by geometric principles, just as Newton requires of rational mechanics. Rational geometric principles are missing in consensus quantum mechanics. Our experiments showed that B2 decay energy is captured in an external capacitor field. When the B2 discharge electron voltage is suppressed to below that required to dislodge the electron from the neutron and convert it to a proton. This threshold is reached when beta electron voltage is suppressed by greater than a 2.5 factor. Our data shows that the high voltage nuclear capacitor suppressed beta electron voltage by a 2.67 factor. Once beta electron voltage is suppressed to below the threshold for neutron to proton conversion, that electron voltage is further suppressed to an equivalence with the voltage of the external capacitor field. Beta electron voltage equalizing with capacitor voltage integrates B2 discharge energy into the circuit of the external capacitor. This integration occurs in a known quantum discharge pattern. In the mid-1950s, Enrico Fermi proposed equations for a set of oscillators which stimulate one another in a sequential pattern. He showed that the energy of each oscillator, which start out as nearly equal, may acquire a pattern whereby one discharge lends part of its energy to the subsequent discharge, and that this pattern can be a quantum formula. One quanta of energy may be exchanged for two quanta of energy. B2 discharges are forced into capacitor field voltage by increasing the capacitor's amperage per discharge. The increased amperage for all B2 discharges average a little over 19 times. However, this amperage increase is forced into a Fermi resonance. The time between B2 discharges have been regularized and compelled into a sequential Fermi resonance. 
12.76 times amperage gains are now followed by 25.5 to amperage gains. The Fermi resonance formulation requires quantum geometry. It is not a conventional Euclidean three-dimensional formulation. The increased amperage of the B2 discharges is controlled by the number of ionic discharges, or discharges which are not increased in amperage. However, the exact method of control cannot be anticipated by conventional capacitance theory, because it is quantum in nature. The number of ionic discharges contained in 0.375 second B2 discharge time determines the amperage gain of the B2 discharge. In standard capacitance theory, discharge is equal to amperage times time of discharge. Therefore, the greater the number of ionic discharges which the capacitor forces upon any B2 discharge time, the lower will the B2 discharge amperage be. The amperage gain factor of 25.52 from 1 B2 discharges followed by an amperage gain factor of 12.76 from the next B2 discharge. This is the normal Fermi pattern in which one quanta of energy is exchanged for two quanta of energy. The experimental data provides a mathematical explanation of the Fermi pattern, a mathematical explanation which correctly derives the quantum dimensional neutron. In order for the capacitor field to force B2 discharges into a Fermi resonance, the lower 12.76 B2 discharge must borrow an ionic discharge from the time frame of the higher 25.52 B2 discharge. This gives the time frame of the 12.76 B2 discharge a total of 8 ionic discharges. This additional ionic discharge added to the time frame of the 12.76 B2 discharge must be subtracted from the time frame of the 25.52. Subtracting the borrowed ionic discharge leaves the 25.52 B2 discharge with a total of 4 ionics. The 12.76 B2 has 8 ionics, and the 25.52 B2 has 4 ionics for a ratio of 2 to 1. A word must be said as to how a capacitor field can manage the borrowing of discharges between time frames. The management of discharge time is the primary function of a capacitor field. The strength of the field is measured by the amount of time it takes to discharge the energy stored in the field. The quantum squared is, by definition, an expression of energy. We can set the exchange energy establishing the Fermi pattern equal to the quantum squared. Since two quanta of energy are being exchanged for one quanta of energy, the quantum squared is equal to the 12.76 B2 discharge. Twice the quantum squared is equal to the 25.52 B2 discharge from the ionic discharges, as revealed by the experimental data, we can set the 12.76 B2 discharges and their ionics, to be equal to the 25.52 B2 discharges and their ionics. This equality reveals a quantum with a value of 2. A quantum value of 2 is true only for the inverted quantum squared. It is never true for the quantum squared. The inverted quantum squared exists only in the neutron producing what science has come to call the neutrino. It is delusional to think that conventional engineering can produce a practical nuclear capacitor from our experimental data. Our data lie outside the range of what are considered possible outcomes in electronic and nuclear engineering. Further, the engineering standards required of the capacitor cannot be anticipated by those systems of engineering.
The conversion of the rational mechanical nuclear capacitor to a practical mechanical capacitor is fulfilled by converting the capacitor from thorium-234 to thorium-233. Our experimental capacitor used naturally occurring thorium-234, which is produced by the alpha decay of uranium-238. Because the half-life of U-238 alpha decay is so long, a very small number of thorium-234 atoms are present at any one time and this allowed us to see and distinguish their beta decay events. There are not enough such events to produce a practical amperage, however. Thorium-233 is bred by slow neutrons and can be increased to practical amperage levels by increasing neutron flux rates. However, actual beta decay events will no longer be distinguishable and their performance must be inferred by the rational quantum mechanical mathematics revealed by the 234 experiments. Conventional engineering will not be able to make those inferences. For example, there is a limited range of voltages by which capacitors can integrate Fermi pattern beta energy into their fields. Practical capacitor voltages are restricted because the ionic amperage for the capacitor field and the quantum ionic exchange amperage are not equivalent. To acquire a close ionic field amperage between time frames, one must choose field voltages correctly. At greater or lesser voltages than this optimal voltage, the ionic field amperage between time frames begin to diverge. Applied voltages which are outside this optimal range will lose the beta energy and cease functioning as nuclear capacitors. This is a mathematical and technical complexity which is well outside the specifications available to conventional engineering. Conventional nuclear and electronic engineering could not spec the device correctly. Over-allegiance to conventional engineering principles is dysfunctional. We were provided an example of this when we consulted the head of a nuclear engineering department linked to one of the better nuclear facilities in the country. When showing our, da showing our data, he instinctively tried to identify the ionic discharges as being merely the alter alternate current cycling provided to the direct current field transformer. His conclusion in this was definitive despite the fact that the alternate current cycle is 60 Hz and the ionic discharges were measured at only 35 Hz. Further, his diagnosis occurred despite the fact that the ionic discharges were clearly associated with the beta discharges, not distributed equally across time frames as alternate current cycling must be. His instantaneous diagnosis Diagnosis prevented him from further aiding us in testing of an early thorium-233 prototype. A second example occurred when we took a safety problem with the thorium-233 capacitor to an electronics engineer. We were concerned about the safety issues around the extensive electrostatic field produced by the nuclear capacitor. The test nuclear capacitor, using restricted amperage thorium-234, projected a field of four feet. The practical capacitor will accumulate greater amperage as increasing numbers of thorium-233 atoms are captured under neutron bombardment. The rational mechanics taken from our experiments show that the practical electrostatic field will increase 20 times as fast as the amperage increases. The field will extend to an unknown extent, providing electrostatic shock potential to anything in its path. Rather than help solve a very real safety issue, the electronics engineer denied the field was possible. In his experience, a field of the extent we were describing would require a capacitor of millions of volts, not the restricted voltage we were using. He simply could not imagine a capacitance field which was multiplied by the energy of beta decay. 
His solution was, re was to rerun our test experiments until they produced a field measure with which he felt comfortable. He wanted to redo the experiments until they gave us a different result. A practical nuclear capacitor simply cannot be produced using off-the-shelf nuclear and electronic engineering. The conversion of the rational mechanics of thorium-234 nuclear capacitor to the practical mechanics of the thorium-233 capacitor will require engineers of a new breed. It will require self-taught nuclear and electronic engineers rather than engineers who are merely consuming current engineering principles by rote learning. It will require engineers with a history of creative design who can integrate the rational quantum mechanics revealed by our, exper our experiments. It will require en engineers who are staff members of the Snake River End Radiation Lab and therefore who are taught by the lab and provide full engineering services back to the lab.